right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from sunny San Diego. And today I'm delighted to be joined by Jason Kramer, who is across the other side of the country in New York. How are you doing, Jason? I'm doing well, thanks, John. Yeah, and Jason is the founder of Cultivize, a consulting firm that specializes in B2B lead nurturing strategies and technologies with over 15 years experience running a creative agency. Jason identified revenue gaps in marketing and sales funnels for distributors, service providers, marketing agencies, and manufacturers. And he launched Cultivize to provide custom solutions and empower businesses to connect prospect and customer data with marketing campaigns and sales activities. Uh, and what we're going to talk about that today is how to stop lead leakage in your sales funnel. And let's face it, uh, Jason, that's probably the thing that ages sales leaders, manage say executives and all of that is, is looking at big pipelines that suddenly don't translate into a lot of business at the end of the day, and they shrink as they move through the the sales process. So lead leakage is a is a serious issue that that afflicts most organizations. So what 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 have you discovered? What are some of the things that you've discovered that uh, contribute to lead lead leakage? Well, I think it comes down to a few factors. I mean, one of them is consistency. Um, so having a consistent sales process. A lot of times sales teams are really excited about an opportunity that's saying, hey, I'm ready to buy. I'm interested in your product, your service, and that's a relatively easy close. But then they forget to follow up on the ones that say, well, this sounds interesting, but I'm not ready to make a decision right now. And so they often get caught up with other day-to-day -day tasks. And the person they spoke to six months ago, they forgot about. And John, you and I know that everyone that's in the market to buy will most likely eventually buy. It's just a matter of when that purchase date is and who are they talking to at that particular moment and who are they going to buy from? Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with you. And I think it becomes a, an even more acute issue in, in when we get into a, a market like this, when there's a downturn, when when things are a little tighter. Your your biggest competitor is often the no decision. So you if you if you're not following up, if you're not continuing to to create value in the process, you're giving them an excuse to actually not to buy. That's right. Um, and what's interesting is that, you know, over 63% of people, a recent study showed that who are not ready to buy will actually buy. So it's mm -hmm. not a matter of that they're not going to buy. It's a matter of making sure that you have the proper process. Um, for us, it really comes down to what we call lead nurturing strategy, mm -hmm. right? So having a process that involves both email outreach, phone calls, maybe a touch on social media, on LinkedIn. Maybe if it's a local sale, it's popping into the visit, you know, the office and saying hello. Um, so there's all different factors, but what we often see is that a lot of times sales organizations, they leave it up to the salesperson to create their own process. Mm -hmm. And that's where the lead leakage really happens because management doesn't have a way to systematically make sure the sales team is following up on all these leads. And the other consideration too is that often companies are spending a lot of dollars within marketing, going to trade shows, whatever channels they're doing to generate these leads. So that lead could have costed, you know, you know, fifty dollars, a few hundred dollars. And if they're not doing their due diligence to follow up on it, it's really just burning money at that point. Yeah, no, no, I'm absolutely. And I and I think that's somewhat sometimes where you know, there's initial enthusiasm early in the in the process. Everybody, you know, the, it gets excited. But uh, as it goes on, as you said, the problem is the customer is not operating on our time frame very often, and therefore, uh, if we let our initial excitement kind of wane, and then we don't put the focus in over the time, yeah, you, we're right. We're just we're just burning through money. So, what are some of the what are some of the strategies that you advise companies to do to uh, to overcome this? Number one is obviously have a uniform sales process. Obviously, it's a sales process, absolutely, John. It's also having a system. In fact, um, there was a study that HubSpot did that's saying that only thirty six percent of companies are actually having a lead nurturing process in place. So, what does that really mean? So, you ask for tips. Well, one tip is making sure that you have a CRM and a system that is there and capable and adoptable by the sales team. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. It's no good having technology if no one's using it. So the first thing a company can do is evaluate what type of tech stack they have that's helping their sales team really excel at ultimately selling the product or service and to figure out if that if that technology is actually doing the job or not. And if no one's using it, then clearly something's going on, right? So we need mm-hmm. to look at that first. The second thing is to really look at who are the top salespeople? What are their best practices? What are they doing to follow up with those leads? And what are those salespeople that aren't having those traits doing? And then really bridging the gap between them. Another important factor to look at is the content that's being going out, right? Mm-hmm. So a lot of times, often, again, whether it be a business you know, uh, manager at, at a senior level, the CEO of the company is just relying and hoping that the communication that's being done um, is of the par that they would expect. But mm-hmm. oftentimes, the salesperson is not maybe a good wordsmith, right? And so the emails they're writing are just sell, 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 right? And they're not mm-hmm. massaging it and the, the tonality of, is, of it is off. So I would uh, encourage anybody listening today is, Look at the emails that your sales team is sending out. And if you're a salesperson yourself, put yourselves in the shoe of the buyer and say, okay, if I got this email, would I respond to it? Would I be encouraged to have a conversation? And that's a few ways that you can start exploring what are the different missing elements that are going to help you stop the leakage in your sales funnel. Yeah. And and, uh, just coming back to a couple of those, uh, one of the ones you said there about uh, looking at your best salespeople. Sometimes people make the mistake of they think, okay, this is top performing salesperson. I'll just ask them what they do. Uh, and the thing is that there's a lot of top performing people who are what we would call unconsciously competent. They don't really know what they do. Mm-hmm. Sure, you can ask them. So it takes it takes probably a sales manager, sales leader to actually sit with them and really understand what they do. And, and, you know, sit with your top performers and really understand what they do and then see what commonalities, what you can kind of sort of codify from that, because um, just relying on anecdotal, uh, they probably won't even be able to tell you how good, why they're oh, as they are. Absolutely, Jean. And the <laughs> one thing I will tell you is that it's, it's amazing how many successful multimillion dollar businesses that we talk to even work with. A lot of the things that those people do, whether it be the sales team or just their process, it's all up here, yeah. right? It's all from just mental memory, from repetition. So you're ex- exactly right. Sometimes you have to pull that out of them and say, well, how many times did it take you to call this person or email this person before you, you were able to, to sell them or mm-hmm. before you were able to get that meeting? And what and how many you know touches points did you have? Did you use social media? And so you're absolutely right. You have to ask these questions and be inquisitive of pulling out from them what is working for them and what isn't working for them. Yeah. And one, one of the one of the things that's you know key to, to most top salespeople is they don't want to waste their time on things that aren't going to you know bring them closer to to a sale. So they're going to be more uh, discerning about their early stage uh, the early stage of their funnel, their pipeline. They're going to get rid of things a lot faster than say, you know, a mediocre, low performing salesperson would because they would hang on to it. And I think that's always key. And this is something that a lot of businesses still struggle with is the idea of shrinking your pipeline for better quality, because it seems counterintuitive. And people are always like, oh, the more you have in your pipeline, the better. Well, mm, the more the more of the right things you have, yeah, the more of everything, it just makes you feel good for a while, but ultimately it doesn't deliver. I would agree 100%. I mean, quality over quantity when it comes to sales is really imperative. Um, you know, the other thing, too, that's an untapped resource on a similar topic is the existing pool of past customers and existing customers that are in the database, right, in the CRM for that organization. Mm-hmm. Because we both know it's, and I'm sure a lot of listeners, you know, here today, it's more cost effective to go back and try to cross sell and, and upsell to an existing or past customer than spending money on lead gen to find a brand new customer that you've never worked with. Mm -hmm. And so I think a lot of times too, some, you know, in some cases, salespeople don't see that opportunity to kind of go back through the Rolodex, say, okay, who can I call that we haven't spoken to in the last six months or 12 months and try to re-engage them because they were happy with us. And maybe there's an opportunity to do more business with them. 
Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's obviously a, a critical one. And sometimes um, people, I think, don't understand that you have to equip these people, like your contacts. So maybe they're in a department, maybe they're happy with your product or service. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to go to another department and evangelize on your behalf, right? Uh, so you have to you have to help them understand maybe opportunities for expansion. Then you have to equip them with with you know uh, good communications that they can share internally. Absolutely. So when you see when you work with people and and say you know they have a they have a sales process in place. Uh, what do you do in terms of making sure that that sales process is properly aligned and is 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 reviewed on a regular basis? Because I think that's a big mistake people make too, is they think nobody likes putting processes together. So they put the process together and say, good, we have a sales process that will do us for the next while. And the thing is, the darn customers keep changing their behavior. So your sales process keeps getting out of sync. Yeah, I mean, so there has to be, um, you know, a set of deliverables by management in terms of reporting, right? So it's no good to instruct your sales team, say, this is the process that you guys have to follow if the sales managers themselves aren't going to make sure mm -hmm. that there's accountability, right? So, yeah. you know, it doesn't have to be a very formal SLA, but some type of responsibility where we say, okay, the managers are going to, you know, look at this on a daily basis, a monthly basis, which encourages the sales team to utilize whatever system they have, right? So the process is important, John, but it's also about how the process is being implemented. And what we find sometimes is that there's a lack of, lack of technology to be able to make that simple. Mm -hmm. Because you, I think you said something before, which is really important and smart, is that a salesperson just wants to sell, right? They don't want to go through all these extra steps that take some outside of that sales process. So if you don't have a CRM or some type of platform to be able to update records, to put people through the different stages in a systematic way that's easy, that's user intuitive, that can be done with flexibility, then the sales team is probably not even going to do anything, right? Mm -hmm. They might follow that process and they might take notes down on a piece of paper or use a Google sheet, you know, to, to keep records of things. But when you have that fracture of information, it becomes really difficult, again, for management, for the CEO of a company to understand what is my sales team doing and are they actually moving in the right direction? Yeah, because I mean, I, I, I agree with you. And it's, it's always, uh, it's always fascinating, but we all take our leads from those above us, right? I mean, that's what happens. So salespeople will take their lead from a sales, uh, a sales manager or sales leader. So if that person isn't, uh, if that sales leader isn't using the CRM to do reviews, if they're not looking at the data, making sure, okay, um, we've made it as e easy for you as possible. This is a great CRM, you know, it's a great interface like Pipeliner. And uh, <laughs> so it's easy to use. But if I then call you up and I don't, and I never even reference the CRM, if I don't look at your pipeline, everything, we do everything just kind of like piecemeal, then the message you're getting from me is, yeah, it's not that important. I don't have to worry about it. Right, exactly. And so there has to be that, um, you know, unified adoption of the whole company to say this is something that's important. And, you know, the other factor, which we touched on very briefly, but I feel very strongly about is often companies, their marketing team, their sales team don't communicate as effectively as they should. Mm -hmm. So to really get, you know, this to be really worked in a way where you're going to get maximum results um, and, and not to kind of put that into a very um, simplified you know, explanation, but you got to have sales and marketing talking to each other. And whether that's sharing data, whether it's, you know, being in joint meetings, because marketing is spending money and an effort to get leads in front of the sales team. Yeah. And if the, if this marketing team doesn't know if those leads are good, if they're qualified, if they're unqualified, and if they don't know, you know, what's happening after the lead is generated, then you really, at that point, just, you know, burning both ends of the candle because, Marketing is still trying to just fill the funnel at the top and sales is trying to close the deals. But if the, uh, the you know, if those leads aren't qualified, right. Then, yep. you know, then it's going to be harder for the sales team to do their job effectively. So 
that's something that we really look for when we work with companies is, are they already talking? Are the teams talking? You know, what is the relationship like? Who is doing the marketing? Is it in set in, you know, in-house? Is it an external agency? Um, and either scenario works for us, but we have to make sure that there's that relationship, you know, between those departments. Yeah, and 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 we do talk about that a lot here, actually, on uh, sales pop about sales and marketing alignment, and basically how we shouldn't really be talking about it in 2023, but here we are, uh, mm -hmm. because it would seem so um, seem so obvious. But but you're but you're a thousand percent correct here. Is that if if marketing and sales are not kind of joined at the hip today. If if they still belong to that old uh, uh, outdated mindset of good fences make good neighbors and here's where I finish and here's where you start, that's not the way uh, business operates today. That's not the way customers operate today. So having that connection is, is really key. And as you said, uh, if you're not really investigating and looking and getting feedback on the lead you're providing and the nurturing you're providing and you're not tweaking it or, you know, um, you know, checking, are we getting the right quality? Are we getting, are we focused in the right area? Is our, is our target customer still the correct one? If you're not constantly doing this work of validation, you know, then you're, you're, you're missing the mark completely, potentially. Yeah, absolutely. And, and you're spending a lot of money at that while yeah. you're doing that. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Uh, so, um, what would what piece of advice would you give to people? Particularly now, it's uh, it's coming toward the end of the year. It's you know New Year's coming. You know, building pipeline. People are skittish. At, you know, sometimes people like like to spend money at this time of year. Sometimes people get more skittish. It just depends. Mm -hmm. um, what is some advice you would give to people as they look to build their their pipeline uh, going into the new year? Well, I think the one thing for sure is to look about what have you done this year, right? Is, is an obvious thing, but not just what have you done, but what have been the results? So, you know, if you've been doing something as simple as email marketing, mm -hmm. you know, what is, what's the effect of that? Not just open rate and click rate, but how many of those people actually visited your website? Hopefully you're tracking that. How many of those people engaged in a sales conversation? Hopefully you're tracking that, right? Mm -hmm. How many converted to sales? What is the revenue generated from your email marketing efforts? And that's just one channel, right? There's potentially dozens for any one company. Um, so that's the first thing I would do is just sort of evaluate what have you done and what are the results? So you can plan for what you want to do for Q1 of next year. The second thing I would certainly do is talk to the sales team, right? And ask them, what are you doing in terms of your daily practice as a salesperson here at the organization? Meaning when you're making calls, Where's your list of calls? Is that just written down on a piece of paper? Mm -hmm. You know, are you getting that from a system, um, you know, a CRM system or something else? And then how are you knowing to follow up? You know, like just walk me through what that is. And if sales managers aren't already having those conversations throughout this past year, I certainly would encourage an end of year discussion to understand what are those channels and, and steps that they're following um, to keep themselves organized, right? And be able mm -hmm. to put that reporting back to the company. Another thing too is evaluating the tech stack. I think that's super important. Yeah. And even to do at the end of every year, maybe even mid-year, you know, there's so much technology, John, out there. I mean, there's there's hundreds of thousands of pieces of software, right? And the one thing that I always say to people when I talk to them and even on these you know shows is software doesn't solve problems, yep. people solve problems, right? Mm -hmm. And so you know, you might be having an expenditure of tens of thousands of dollars every month in software and let's say, OK, well, what is this software doing for us? Is it is it helping us make money? Is it helping us be more productive to stay more organized? Is our software even talking to each other? We might have a tech stack of a dozen different pieces of software and Mary every week is pushing data manually between the systems, right, because they don't talk to each other or mm -hmm. maybe. There is no Mary, right? And and right. now it's just siloed data, which is even worse. Um, so I think evaluation of that is really important. That's something that we help companies do is to evaluate where they sit in terms of their tech stack. Um, and then the last thing I would just talk about is goals. You know, what are the goals for the business? You know, and not just high level goals. Oh, we want to grow. We want to expand into a new market. But what are the specific actionable goals where we can say, okay, what are the steps to reach this goal? Mm -hmm. um, and then if you can put all that together and then start peeling apart that that picture and say, OK, here's what we have to do. Here are the little baby steps we need to take to get to those goals. I think it's going to set a lot of companies up for really great success you know, yeah. coming into the new year.
No, a great piece of advice. And uh, yeah, I love the thing on the tech stack because I do think that is, uh, it's critically important, but it's also kind of today because of all these new tools and AI tools coming out that, and they seem really easily accessible that your tech stack, your sales tech stack could get out of control very quickly, or it could become one of those Frankenstein's monsters, you know, where a couple of people are using this tool, a couple of people are using that tool, and then mm -hmm. you don't, and then it's hard for you to even figure out what's going on. So I think evaluating your tech stack absolutely, absolutely is incredibly important. Listen, Jason, this has been fantastic, great advice. All of Jason's information will be below this video, but before we go, please do tell more about you and Cultivate. Cultivate, yeah. brother. Yeah, no problem. Um, so, um, Cultivize, we're in the business of helping businesses really do all the things we talked about today. So it's not just um, you know CRM technology. We're not a software company. What we're doing is we're helping companies create a strategy to reach those goals. Mm -hmm. And yes, there's technology involved. Um, there's there's content certainly involved in that. But for us, we're working with B two B businesses, manufacturers, and others of the like that have a lot of data. Right? They have a lot of um, moving parts in their business, but they're missing the elements that we talked about today, right? They have the, the disjointed tech stack. Um, so we're looking and in, in helping companies that recognize their things can be done better, things can be improved in terms of their sales process, in terms of connecting the dots between marketing and sales. Mm -hmm. um, and another big push for us, lastly, John, is email deliverability. Um, right. You know, a lot of the things done in the sales world today are done based on email. Yeah. So we we work and have um, different tools where we can see what's happening after you hit send. Is that email even getting into the inbox? Is it just landing up in a promotion folder or spam and no one's seeing it? Um, because at the end of the day, if you're creating great content and no one's seeing it, yeah, then it's really there's no email. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Right. So um, that's another big um, kind of introductory way that we can work together with clients and all this information is on our site, um, cultivize.com slash learn more. Um, a lot of great resources there, some great downloads. And um, as for your listeners today, I'm also going to give away um, a free email audit. So anybody that uh -huh. wants to come to that website, um, we can, regardless of whatever platform you're using, it doesn't matter. Um, we can do a diagnostic and see what actually is happening after you hit send to mm -hmm. your marketing emails. Well, fantastic. Listen, thank you, Jason. Listen, thanks again. Uh, thank you for watching and listening. Great pieces of advice there to implement for as you go into the new year. Uh, and I will see you all again very soon. Thank you. Thank you, John.